Yeah, where to go? Out? Out, my dog. Yeah, at the car, at the car. Everybody has that one loyal friend. <laughs> Brits, you could pick up my girl for me? I can't, I'll check out. I could borrow your tennis. Let's one pretty please. Let's borrow your medication. <sighs> Loyalty doesn't have to be this hard. With Smart's new Stars and Rewards Loyalty Program, prepaid customers get star points easily. Every time you make a call, purchase a bundle or upload credit, you get rewarded. With these points, you can stack them up and get awesome rewards like free data, free SMS, minutes, and extra on uploads plus lots more. So the more you use, the more you get. And if you want to check your reward stars, just download the Smart app, enter the My Account portal, or send a free SMS to Zone. That's 9663. And in the body, write rewards. Then you can enjoy the loyal life. Smart, your full service telecom provider. It's a hammer, it's a drill, it's super handy dance. That's right, folks. It's Super Handy Dad's Month again at Brothers Event. And do we have some super gifts for that super special dad? A Super Handy Dad needs his super tools. And all month long, we're giving you super savings of 15% off all power tools and accessories from Stanley, Black & Decker, Dewalt, Skill, Bosch, and Walkie. 15% off all Stanley hand tools and 15% off sun tool, hand tools, and hardware. So come in today to Brothers Abet on Barrack Road for Super Handed Dad's Month and pick up those super tools at Super Savings. When you bank your way, it's amazing how much time you have to enjoy the more important things in life. You have time for priceless moments. Time to indulge. Time to unwind. Time to take in the view. Time to make memories. Use any of these services and have time for the things that matter most. Bank your way and enjoy the convenience. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. All right, welcome back. This is WUV Wake Up Belize Morning Vibes. It's Friday. It's the 11th day of June 2020. It's the 12th. It's the 12th day. Yes. Uh, yeah, yesterday was the 11th. <laughs> yeah, was, uh, the atmosphere has sort mm. of changed. I don't know. Mm. So, or maybe the age, you know. Okay. Probably. So, yeah. What in that would like? All right, it's the 12th day of June 
2020, and we appreciate very much to have in studio the Commissioner of Police. And for those of you who don't know, he's not only a Commissioner of Police, he's also an officer of the court as an attorney qualified. And uh, so he brings more than just his experience as a cop to the job. He also brings a, a knowledge of the law, which is also important in his job. Welcome, Commissioner. Yes, good morning, Brother Nuri. Good morning, Sister Dominique. Good morning. And good morning to your viewers and listeners across the country. I want to apologize to those who are calling. <clears throat> We're going to hold the phone calls if we have per time at the very end of the conversation with the commissioner, we'll open the lines. But he has an appointment in Belmopan, has already informed us that he has a limited time, and we have a list of questions that we'd like to get uh, clear. One of the first things that come to mind, Commissioner, of course, and I think a lot of people would want to know, uh, of your reaction when you saw the, uh, the police officer um, with his knee on the neck of Mr. George Floyd, uh, which contributed to his, his debt and the obvious protests that exploded in the United States and all over the world uh, regarding this, uh, what has been now a charge of murder? Yeah, um, from a law enforcement standpoint, um, it surely do not look good. Uh, police officers are supposed to be people who uphold the law and uh, must always ensure that whatever we do is done in the interest of making our citizens safe, regardless of who they are. Mm -hmm. The police sees no color, the police sees no race, the police sees no culture, the police see people as people, people as one. And so, as many of those who are protesting are saying, and I have also listened to some of the chiefs of police in the United States who have condemned the actions of the police officers in uh, Minnesota. And uh, what they are saying is the truth, which is that as officers of the law, they are to protect and serve. And whenever you have actions like those, that seems to derail the good work that the police do and uh, draw unnecessary attention to the police. It doesn't speak well to the law enforcement community. Mm -hmm. And so as law enforcement agencies around the world, we have to condemn actions like those. And uh, we must understand that we are policing now in, in a new era. It is not like before where people were uneducated, people um, they do not know their rights. Uh, times have changed. We're seeing more and more students engaging in legal studies, trying to understand more what the law is. And uh, these are persons who are police. So you'll find that a very wide spectrum of the society are more cognizant of the law than police officers. Mm -hmm. And so as police, we need to ensure that we step up and uh, most importantly that we treat people with respect and ensure that we apply the golden rule mm -hmm. to treat people in the same manner as we ourselves would like to be treated mm -hmm. and i've always emphasized that to my officers yes i know at times some of them don't listen and go on a frolic of their own and do things that embarrasses us but at the end of the day people need to understand that not every actions of police officers out there can be controlled by the commissioner or the senior rank of the department mm. but what we can control is how we end up dealing with those officers who step out of line those who do things that brings embar embarrassment to the, the department in a whole and I, I believe that we have been doing well in terms of striking that balance um, dealing swiftly with officers who commit these egregious breaches of discipline and uh, try as best as we can to restore public trust and confidence in the work that we do I, I wanted to, to just jump on that real quick. Um, how do, what, what do you, I, I know you spoke to police brutality and um, to the police officers who sometimes step out of line in terms of what the values of the, of the department are. But what is the department doing in terms of, and, and indeed under your leadership, to ensure that there's a proactive step to make sure that police officers know outside of their own personal bratopsy, um, that you know, people just shouldn't be brutalized. That is not their role as police officers. They are to serve and protect. So what proactive things are being done in terms of training, anything like that in the department to ensure that 
that the, this doesn't happen as a culture? Yes, I can tell you that the professional standard branch has been extremely busy doing training across the country, particularly in the justifiable use of force and harm, sensitizing officers in terms of the level of force that they can use if they are to encounter a certain situation. Other than that, the local commanders will also have in service training with their officers on a weekly basis. Again, this, these are being done with a view to look at topics that we see the officers are weak in and try to bring them up to standard. I know again that myself and Brother Nuri have discussed um, as a part of his terms of reference to see how he too can assist us with training where that is concerned. So I, I foresee that in, in very short time, um, Mr. Nuri will be able to do more training for us with police officers to sensitize them in terms of the vulnerable communities, how we can treat these, um, these different communities with a view to not let these people feel like, you know, they are inferior to us. I, I personally, I see myself as a people person and uh, I tend to, to relate more with the grassroots or the people that refer to as nobody on the streets. And I, I like that because when you do that, you get, you get the sense of what these people are going through. You get a sense of um, feeling how they are feeling and, and seeing it with them. And uh, with that, then you can see how you can help them because it is not just about me. It's also about those um, young men who are not so fortunate. And some of them are in a position not because they want to be in a position, but they have no choice. And uh, we must try to find a way to see how we can let them understand that despite the circumstance that they are in, they are still value for life. And uh, we must not be the ones to shove them further down in the ground, but we must try to see how we can uplift them from where they are. And I think that once, as a community, we see things that way, we can do a lot. Many people are out there um, shouting, oh, black people and young people, this and young people. You, if you were to ask them, what have you done for these same black people or these same young people to try and uplift them? The answer is nothing. To, 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 to stand on a pulpit or to go on a talk show and uh, yell about black people and poor people and bring down the police, that is not helping these people. What we need to do is to get on the ground and see what we can do to work with these people to bring them up. And that is why I appreciate people like Brother Nuri, um, people like Miss Westby, people like Miss Finnegan when she was engaged with us. Th there are many others. I think there's a guy, Tam Greenwood Jr. He is out there as well. There are many of these um, activists who are out there who are trying to see what they can do to help our, our unfortunate people to try and see what they can lift them up to, to, to another level. And we need more people to do it. The more hands we ha have on deck, the more we'll be able to achieve. One of the things that has come up in the discussion in the United States, and it's good because it's a periodic rising up of the conversation. Most of the time it's underneath and it's being treated just as isolated criminal incidents. But this killing of George Floyd has now brought to surface an entire conversation surrounding even the type of training that police officers are receiving around the world. I want to ask you very specifically a question that I'd asked you before when you were here maybe two or three months ago regarding the choke hole. Uh, in the United States now, we are hearing that the chokehold is not only a, a policy issue on individual police departments, but even the Congress of the United States now wants to make it completely illegal and ban it from all police departments in every jurisdiction in the United States. Now, when it comes to Belize, we know that we've had incidences of... Uh, Chokehold. The one that I'd asked you about when you were here before was the police officer that was coming off the boat from Kikaka. What is the position in terms of the law when it comes to chokehold? Is it illegal in Belize or simply a prohibition according to police policy? Chokehold, Brother Nuri, is a technique. Not anybody knows how to do a chokehold. That mm. is a trained technique. And the officer who was engaged in that chokehold in Kikaka, he, was, he is trained to do that, not in Belize. He was trained, he was a member of MIT, and you know MIT gets specialist training from mm. the US and, mm. and different agencies. 
And so long as you can apply it properly, it is okay. What happened with George Floyd is not a true word. Because if, if, if a person and they said the policeman I saw on George Floyd's neck, they were small, he police. Mm -hmm. They were big policemen. Mm -hmm. And to be kneeling on a person's neck is not even close to a true word. Mm -hmm. And you can hear the person saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And Indeed. despite that, the officer still remains there. But that and was an officer, according to what one of his fellow officers said, he was a training officer, so he should have known that what he was applying there was not something so that exactly. would cause that man. Because his, so weight, his weight alone is, is too much indeed, to be a person. Indeed. But my question specifically is, is chokehold illegal in Belize or is it permitted on the part of a police who, like you say, was trained to do it? If it is done with a purpose to neutralize a situation, a person who is behaving boisterous as a case or violent, it is okay. But, but in some just, jurisdiction, I'm saying to you, you, you Commissioner, just, it's being banned yes. completely You're across. You're asking me about Belize. I'm yeah. telling you now. It is not something you can just go and just grab somebody and put in a hole. Uh -huh. That is illegal. That's an assault. Uh -huh. But if it is done by an officer, even anybody, as, as, as an ordinary member of the public, to neutralize a person who is behaving in such a way, then it is okay. But again, they must ensure that the force use is only sufficient to neutralize the person to the extent that the person calms down. And that's it. All right. So you're then saying it is legal to use, but the person who uses it must be trained to do it. Yeah. So if a person uh, experiences a chokehold in Belize, the question will not be the use of the chokehold, but whether the person who uses it was trained. Is that what you're saying? You have to look at both, but I'm worried. Yeah. If the person is trained and the, ex the, the reason for yeah. and the extent to which it is used. Mm. Like I said, it is not something that just grabs somebody and put them through a hole. Uh, that doesn't work like that. That's an assault. The fact that it's being banned and it's getting uh, traction not only in the United States but other jurisdictions, I understand France is also banning it. The UK is looking at the same. Will that influence the decision of your department in saying whether you're trained to do this or not, this is not a tactic that should be used when you're using it to the civilian. That is surely something that we can look at. I don't see any difficulty with that. I, see. I, I, see. I, I wanted to just reference, um, and it's a perfect, perfect piece of law to reference given your qualifications, no? I wanted to ask you whether or not you agree with it given the discourse you just had. So at, it's section 4.2. It says, a person shall not be regarded section as- Section 4.2 of what? Of the constitution. Okay. Of the least. A person shall not be regarded as having been deprived of his life in contravention of this section if he dies as a result of the use to such extent and in such circumstances as are permitted by law of such force as is reasonably justifiable. A, for the defense of any person from violence or for the defense of property. B, in order to effect a lawful arrest or to prevent the escape of a person lawfully detained. C, for the purpose of suppressing a riot, insurrection, or mutiny or D, in order to prevent the commission by that person of a criminal offense, or if he dies as a result of the lawful act of war. Is that something that, uh, that, that, that would be justifiable use of force if someone dies in the custody of police, sir? It, it depends, again, because while you, 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 you read what the Constitution says, mm -hmm. you then have to read that in conjunction with the Criminal Code Section 32 to Section 36, okay. which is the sections that deal with the justifiable use of force and harm. And uh, in those sections, it, it basically breaks down to, to you what level of force can be used for what. So even though the Constitution might say that the police can, or, or anybody who dies um, while escaping from the police is justified, that is not really so. Because then you still have to look then to justify with of force and harm. Because police just cannot say that, oh, because you are a convicted um, prisoner and you escape, they cannot shoot you just like that. And this, because of the constitution, say, oh, well, that is laughable because the constitution said that if you are a prisoner who is trying to escape and you are killed, then that is justified. No. You still have to go beyond that. And uh, section 32 to 36 will then explain to you the, 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 the circumstances under which the force can be used. And, uh, the very key words that you'll find in those sections 
are necessary and proportionate. Okay. The force used must always be proportionate to the threat that the person is feeling. And it doesn't have to be a police, it could be anybody, mm -hmm. including you. If you feel threatened by a person's action, if you respond to that threat, your response must be proportionate to the threat that you face. So if the person, per se, have a firearm, and uh, the person approaches you, and you have a gun too, you don't have to wait for that person to lift up his hand and shoot before you shoot. The law is that you can protect yourself. And uh, it gives you that opportunity to make that preemptive strike, where you can take out that person before that person takes you. Okay, if that person the gun and shoot, you might not be able to respond. You might be dead. Right? So that is how it must be looked at. Let's look at uh, an approach of policing now, again, not only in Belize, but in several jurisdictions. We know that historically, the police uh, in Belize comes out of the British constabulatory, where uh, Bobby was more a community policeman. Yes. He carried his weapon, was just the club and not very rare, uh, only the Scotland Yard and those who would actually use weapons. But now we've seen that change completely where police around the world and here in Belize are becoming increasingly militarized, even in their uniforms, uh, in their tactics. Uh, we know of, and very specifically if our audience would uh, Google, uh, Mr. Grossman, who is one of the trainers of police uh, in the United States. And we know that many of our policemen, like the MIT, like the GSU, have in fact been trained by these units in the United States. And we've seen an increase in these kinds of tactics. And these tactics, Grossman says specifically, it's really us against them. It's not we are members of the community, we are part of keeping the community safe, but rather we are looking at citizens now as enemies and this is particularly so in the case that we saw in the United States. Now, I'm asking you, Commissioner, if you could share with the audience, uh, you're a 30-year-plus veteran. Um, where I does it? 30 years, but I know you. Huh? I know you 30 years yet. All right, OK. <laughs> yeah. Plus, you look young. But, uh, uh, well, I certainly go back uh, as far back as Commissioner Willoughby, uh, at Adolphus, actually and have been watching the movement of our police becoming increasingly militarized. Even constables now are seen with sidearm, uh, which did not exist in the past. Please explain to us what is the justification for this increased military attitude, including uniforms, including high-powered weapons, being used on citizens who are, yes, a percentage of dangerous people, but by and large, our people are weaponless. By and large, our people have never had no reported firefights between police and person. I'm not saying that there have not been elements, but very small uh, historical experience of police fighting against a, a group like you see in Jamaica. I'm asking for what is the justification? How did it evolve to this point? And I'm asking you specifically as a police that puts, as you said earlier, a lot of emphasis on the ordinary people. You're a community police uh, uh, a person. Why have we gone to this point? And where do you see us going in terms of the future? Reducing this or increasing this? But I know right there is a saying that I do believe in, that the police are the consent of the um, society. And I do not ascribe to your comment that it seems as it is a police against a citizen, but that is not the, 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 the concept of militarizing certain units within the police. You, you would agree with me that if we were to look at the society today, to the society you grew up in, 50, I don't know how old you are. Thank you, my brother. It's all right. Where are you? It was from the gay chat from the yeah, best yeah, man. Okay. <laughs> 50 years ago, that it has really changed. Yeah. We, we are now dealing with a, with a set of young people who, who the propensity for violence have increased significantly. Mm. And uh, we're seeing that 
the, the public in a whole, the law-abiding citizens have become more threatened by the behaviors of some of our young people. And uh, some of our young people are still more heavily armed than the police. That is the reality. Because when the police officer was out there with a 38 or a 9 millimeter, the gunman, some of them had AK-47, AR-15, and these sorts of weapons. Mm. And so because- but we have no, we have, that's the point I'm making. We have no historical examples of firefights between them using AK-47s against police. I mean, and this is something you could go back and check the records. We have had weapons, high caliber weapons found but we've not had the Trivoli Garden situation where these men are actually cordoned off a whole area and they're fighting the police. So why is the justification for what you're saying? But I, know I, I, I do not agree again that we have not had any situations where high power weapons have been used at the police. Mm -hmm. I know of instances, um, and remember we don't only deal with our local criminals, we have craft border bandits. Mm -hmm. You would recall the, um, May first robbery on the Hummingbird Highway when the bandits came from across the border mm. and they killed one of the the the, the um, be there volunteer soldier. Mm. Police officers were shot at. We have the the incident recently in um, Blue Creek where the police who responded to a plane landing were shot at. The vehicle had some big bullet holes on it from either AK forty seven or some other high high power type weapons. Mm. We have incidents in the um, in Chicky Bull, the, 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 the Caracol area, back in the early 90s, when there was this streak of robberies in the um, Caracol area, it crashed with bandits. But those are all so, foreigners. Uh, what, yes. what about in, in, in Gungulung, in, in George Street, in these small areas? We have not had confrontation between youths on the street or even any other criminal that is shooting big weapons at police. We don't know that, but I know it. Police have been shot at, but we know something they miss. And uh, the fact that they have these big guns, you think they just have it for style? Uh -huh. They don't. Are we supposed to sit back and wait until they say, well, let us take out our big guns and use it on the police before the police do something? Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. we cannot do that. If it is that we know that the weapons are out there, we have intelligence that weapons are out there, it's our duty mm -hmm. to go after those persons who are stockpiling weapons because they're doing so for some reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, while they may not have used at the police, they have used it on citizens, on mm -hmm. civilians. Mm -hmm. The, the civilians are, are there for the police to protect. And so any threat that the public faces, it is the duty of the police to see how they can utilize that threat by whatever means necessary so long as it is done within the framework of the land. Mm -hmm. Your policy of community policing, because I've worked directly with you, has been very, very strong. Um, but I don't know, and this is the comment I'll ask you to make now, if you have not reduced the amount of uh, effort in the community policing and resorted back to the other methods being used by the police for crime control. The community policing seems to be getting a revival in several jurisdictions as, listen, we've got to reconnect with the community as opposed to making the police uh, uh, just someone who comes when he's going to react to a crime situation. So please tell us about your policy around the idea of community policing. Well, po community policing, Nuri, is essential. I've always said that we cannot just be all out police, policing, just aggressively going after people. Whatever method we use to address crime must have a balance. Mm -hmm. You must have that side that is going to listen, that is going to find solution, that is going to analyze, that is going to, to see how they can help those persons who are in need of help. And you must have that side that must be there to, to deal with those persons who are helping mm -hmm. on trying to make the society live in a state of havoc or in a state of, of, of threat. And so you must strike that balance. I have always said to, to my officers, it is always good to talk to people, listen to people. But not everybody you could talk to, not everybody you could listen to. Because some people, you try to talk to, you try to listen to them, and they have an attitude. They have a different approach because their mind is set on what they want to do. Mm. But that does not mean that we must put everybody in the same basket. We must still be able to deal with those persons who want to listen 
and who want to, to make that change and help them to make that change. And those who don't want to listen then, by all means, then you know what to do. I wanted to, to, to get back, because I'm, I'm still on this, this, piece of, <laughs> this piece of law, no? Uh, and I wanted to draw a parallel in the case of, and, and of course get your commentary, in the case of, of Alison Major. Uh, how, how, was that use of proportionate force of chasing someone who was perceived to have contraband or drugs or whatever, and the person was throwing it through the window, and it resulted in him dying um, at, the, at the hands of police. Was that use of any of justifiable force, and how and how is that investigation going? What is the status of that officer? I am sure you'll agree with me that the matter is before the court, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't want to speak on that matter. Uh, the police officer concerned has been charged. The DPP directs what charge must be laid based on the evidence, and the matter is before the court. In terms of where we are with it, it is before the court. The file is with the DPP office, and I believe that very shortly there will be a preliminary inquiry, and the matter will be heard at the Supreme Court. But how successful are the strategies being used to curb police abuse of power? You constantly see. I'm not only talking about police using their influence to extort people as the two officers that were arrested recently, but you've got issues of people complaining that when the police comes in to execute their duty that it becomes violent, officers go for their weapon. Uh, one man showed an example of being burned on his chest, uh, nipple burned off by a police officer. So even though there are efforts to address it with your uh, professional standards uh, and, and, and complaints and the fact that you have made yourself publicly known that you will not tolerate abuse. It continues to happen. So what is being done to, to curb this kind of rogue behavior, not on the part of some officers now, but because many people are saying we continue to say there are only one or two. But there seems to be a culture that, like in the case of George Floyd, if I see you to do something as another officer, I have to stop you if there are illegal thing. I can't say, well, boy, I mean, you know, I have to just go along with this. So I'm asking you a kind of convoluted question here. But the point really is abuse of power continue to surface from your officers. Well, no, like I always said, police officers are not, are not persons who are created in heaven and dropped down on earth. Mm. Police officers come from the same society that we serve. Mm. And while we hear and we see people every day talking about, oh, unruly police and police abuse and this, that, that, that are the police have them people sign on. We try our best to change these officers when they come to us in training. But you would know, growing up in a home, growing up in a society for 18 plus years, before you come to the police, you do a training for six months. We can't change in you know, six months. At the end of the day, that the same public who criticizes us are the ones who train them police or have some of their own rogue police behaving the way they do. My only wish is that we have a policy or a law that would allow the commissioner to dismiss them summarily when they manifest their behavior. You just get rid of them. So what's the process now? You have to go through a whole tribunal process and, and these sort of things. Sometimes it is just frustrating. Mm. Uh, many days I, I, I sit back and I, I ask myself, I say, why, why, why these police officers behave the way they do? Why can't they just listen and be like the others who are out there every day doing their best to serve the public and to give the department a good reputation? Why we have these ones who just have that affinity to want to abuse people? Why? Mm. But at the end of the day, we must go through the process. I, I start to dismiss three the other day. I said I was going to do it summarily and let them take me to court if they wish. 
And they went to a lawyer, and the lawyer wrote, and uh, as a lawyer myself, I have to agree for the lawyer, say. Mr. Commissioner, you can just dismiss the money. I have to go through due process. Hmm. And so with that now, I have now directed that we go through the proper procedure. But at the end of the day, yeah. but I'm it, it becomes frustrating at times to know that you want to do certain things, but the law does not allow you to do it. So what I have done, I have made recommendations to the Minister of National Security to take to Cabinet a piece of law that will now allow the Commissioner to dismiss officers summarily who commits an act that uh, brings, that erodes the public trust and confidence in the police department. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to start somewhere so that officers can see that if you do this, you're going home. Well, it's encouraging to hear you say that because this is one of the things that have come up is that in the United States, and I keep making reference because that's our major uh, media feed in the country and what is happening there is that when officers are charged even with grievous things like killing a person the police union is so strong that the police union can prevent that officer from receiving anything more than just a spunk on his on his on his hand and he's back in the force but the law is now being looked at at the legislative level to in fact dismiss that type of intervention from the union so that the police chief and the attorney general has the right if this person has committed a grievous crime he doesn't have to get any kind of protection he can be summarily yes, dismissed. dismissed so this is sounds like what you're also yes. uh, going to say and in a way you're lucky because the the Minister of Police is also the Attorney, the Attorney General, General yes. which can make it happen. Yes. Since we know that we are limited in time, uh, I want to go from policy and, and, and procedure to look now more at the latest statistics coming out saying that in fact in the last three months crime has gone down. Some people are, 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 are saying that the reason for this is because of the state of emergency you have at other places argued that uh, it ought not to be given the credit ought not to be given simply to the state of emergency but to increase work that has been done by your police department but commissioner when you look at it i mean murder is done robbery is done rape is done several of these major crimes in fact when compared to last year is completely done how could you dismiss the impact of what has been happening in the last three months, which is the state of emergency. Um, but Anuri, the state of emergency itself really and truly put additional burden on the police. Because we have to now police the state of emergency, mm -hmm. and we have to police, we have to still do the core police functions. Now, if you look at it, Across the country, we still see murders happening in, uh, in the north. We still have murders happening in the south. We have murders happening in the west. What have been saving us is the city. And uh, you would know that since we had the state of emergency with the gang members, when they were released, they all agreed that they were going to work with us with a view to put aside the personal differences and try to work with us. Since then, yourself, Ms. Wesley from CYDP, have been extremely busy working with these young men. And we are seeing where they're holding true to their, to their words. And uh, we're not having the murders in Belize City where you used to have like sometimes seven, eight per month, we're not having them. So it is Belize City, and thanks to the, the good work of CYDP yourself and the police who are out there in the different areas to ensure that things remain the way they should, we are seeing a significant reduction in Belize City and uh, by extension, rural Belize. Because even in Ladyville and Hattieville, we have CYDP going in and uh, do conflict mediation with the different groups who, uh, who, who used to be involved in these different activities. Now we, we see now that CYDP is now engaging in Dan Riga 
to try and see what they can do as well to mediate the dispute between the two groups in Namriga. Every policing effort that we do, we must have that mediation aspect because many of these youths are engaged in conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, we cannot end conflict by full-scale policing. We only can end conflict if we put qualified conflict mediators to go in and mediate to these people with a view to defuse the conflict. And once we can do that, coupled with the fact that police officers are out there going after those who might not want to pull the line, it's what is giving the success that we are seeing today. The state of emergency, yes, I'm not going to say it, it do not help. It helps, but it also puts additional burden on us. So I, I maintain the fact that the low crime rate, particularly in Belize City, is not as a result of the state of emergency or the curfew, but rather as a result of the good work of the police, yourself, and CYDP. Um. We have just a few more minutes with the commissioner, so we'll open the phone lines and allow any question that we may not have posed to the commissioner to come in. The number is 2804299. I, I wanted to, yeah. to very quickly ask, uh, I know the last time you were here, I asked you about the mental health of police officers. And you also referenced that the police officers come from these exact same communities that suffer from trauma and um, societal issues. But I wanted to ask a bit about what the police is doing in terms of their policy, in terms of responding to, uh, being first responders to mental health crises. So we see people um, who had mental health issues being arrested, being placed in, in compromising positions, and we know the outcomes of some of those things, and some of them even showing up on social media, the mockery of, of people who are arrested and detained. How is the police, uh, police dealing with those things? Um, I'm happy to, to, to say, Dominique, that we have put together a mental health policy, and we did so in conjunction with the Ministry of Health. We also solicited some um, guidance from Kayla Orozco, and uh, there are just a few more things that we need to tweak that we must agree upon because there are certain things that the Ministry of Health is saying is not their responsibility and we're saying it's not ours as well. And so we just need to agree on that one particular aspect. And once we do that, then I will sign off on that and I will have the mental health policy. All right, here's the first call. Welcome, caller. Hello, hello. Yes, sir. Welcome. Make it short. Please. Hello. Yes, go ahead, sir. Make it short so we could uh, accommodate as many calls as possible. Hello, hello. Yes, we're hearing you. Oh, you're hearing me. All right, good morning. Mr. Commissioner, I'd just like to suggest something to you, you know. I'm my first time caller to even to Creme Radio. Hello, you're hearing me? Yes, yes we're sir. listening. I'm we're hearing you. you. Okay. Yeah. You know, yes, yes, I understand, Mr. Nuri. No, no disrespect. <coughs> what, what, what I'm trying to say? He said... Oh, it began to leave. Yeah, no man, you you're, you're, to us the all right. phone. Yeah, just go ahead. Uh, and uh, okay, okay. Well, what I'm saying is that is, is that um, you say you you confused about why some of your officers behave like this, and you don't know why they they can't listen to you. Because maybe sometimes you guys never even check the backgrounds of some of the officers before they even turn them into police. Like personally, I know a few guys that went to school with me from Corozal here who are now in the police force. Who when I went to school with them were kids that were abused were quiet were, were calm kids where we know that home they were they had problems right like many of them did and then they get into the police force with, with that attitude to be abusive to people that every day where they meet instead of taking it out on the people that cause them then they hurt like somebody somebody I, I i know even a few a guy a guy that is a police right now that his father is is a high-ranking police officer when he gets forced into this police department because his father is trying to train him to become a bully, not a little soft guy that he is. And I know their team. So that's way you probably need to check into, sir. You need to probably check into looking to see the backgrounds of their officers before you know, hire them. Because some of them traumatize as kids and then just say, abuse other people outside because they can't really abuse the one because they hurt. Thank you. Thank you very much, I, I do agree, and we do background checks. But like with everything, but I know, background checks won't be always 100% true. 
Some people say, uh, and, and I want to interject because it's an important call, uh, an important point he's making. Some people say area representatives can bypass those background checks and get people who are really not qualified, but because their constituency uh, supported, allow them to get into the, uh, bypass you and get them into the ranks. Is that true? But I know we, we have to understand something. Politicians are politicians, and uh, politicians have a constituent to serve. And so politicians are always going to be asking favors to, to please a constituent. Mm -hmm. But it is a matter for us to decide whether or not we're going to yield to the request of the politician. Mm -hmm. I have always said, if a politician asks me to do something, once it is something that is lawful, and uh, the person for whom the favor is being asked for is deserving, I have no issue doing it. But if the politician asks me to do something that I know is unlawful, or to do something for somebody who I don't deserve it, then I'm not going to do it. Mm. And so the last good spot that we have, yes, politicians do ask favors for some of them. They, they pass the exam, they pass the thing, and I have no issue with it. And uh, for the most part, I can say that all those persons who were recruited in the last spot, it was the police who decided to take them. Mm. Yes, there are one and two, like I said before, that politicians do ask favor for, but those persons still go through the, the procedures mm. like everybody else would. Um, uh, will me here, and I'm going to go to the call, but will me here uh, ask about the papers that were taken from, I uh, forget the name of the lady, Miss Anne, I think. Miss Anne, yes. Um, uh, you know about the issue, and where, what's the status of that? I don't know if will me here want to be arrested. He was out there too. Mm. And uh, as I said to the officers um, on that in question, that act, action of there was an illegal act. Mm. And all those persons who were engaged out there should be arrested. But was it illegal and on the, the basis of the SOE? Yes, or, it was. Uh, all right. It was. But, but, and, uh, but it came across It came across as if the state was trying to prevent people from exercising but a legitimate people, right. People need to stop the bull crap and talk about the state. If you do something wrong, there is consequences. Mm. We have a state of emergency that, that stipulates for what for, for the different reasons for which people can be out. You cannot go out to protest. That is against the SOE. If you do it, the police will come. Mm. And uh, the intention at the time was to get those documents and all those names on, that, on those papers would have been summoned to go to court. Mm. But I have since rethink the position. I said to the officers, no, we're not going to proceed against them. We're going to leave it as, as that. Mm. And that's it. But how about the return of the papers? It's not going to be returned. Like I said to... to but is that, le is that legal to hold it's not, it's not illegal. her document? It's not illegal. Because it was done at an illegal gathering, then that in itself becomes illegal? That, that is not a legal process, Mr. Brother Nuri. Yes, and at the end of the day, like I said to Nigel Petio, right now, we have a state emergency. Don't be rushing out there to do this or to do that. Don't be calling no meetings. Because if it's illegal, police will come for you. Mm. Squatting is not an offense. Squatting is not a crime. So long as you can squat openly and undisturbed for 12 years on private land, or 30 years on public land, you claim your squatter's rights. Wait until the SOE done, and then you'll do nothing. So you're saying the issue is more one of timing than of exactly. the... I see. OK, so in other words, if after the state of emergency, what Nigel is doing proceeds, mm -hmm. you're saying you have no problem with no. that? No. So long as they don't go on private land, mm -hmm. then the owner of the land, they have an issue and call the police, because the police have to respond then. I see. I see. Right? But if they, if they can find land and they want to spot openly and undisturbed for 12 years or 30 years, then I see. They, they claim the spot as rights. I see. All right. Is the caller still there, uh, JC? Hello? Yeah. Welcome, sir. Thank you for your patience. Yes, good morning. Um, I, my name is Miguel Zayden. You know? I was calling in effect to a case that happened with me about 20 years ago that I reported it in San Ignacio. I'd like to ask the commission, commissioner if it's still the statute of limitation is over that I reported that Alberto Argas had, that's why I give my name because I'm calling his name, he had kidnapped me and took me on the road and tortured me and all that, and there had been nothing. I called a couple of years, I called on crime, I called on love, and 
So I just want to know, does the statute of limitation on something like that expire, kidnapping, is, or is it like murder? Because I, I can't put it to rest. Everybody tells me I've been to a couple of people, JPs, I've been to, I've called all around and everybody is like, why can't you forget it? I can't forget it because it happened to me and I nearly died. So that was one of my questions. The other question is, what is the, that's the main question. And then the other question is, what's happening with the police that did the video and the case with the, is that in front of the court? Because these things are important. Thank you. Yes, the, the video that the police officers did with the two persons in a sexual act, that matter is before the court. And the officers are also before a tribunal. Um, in respect to the first question, I am not familiar with that matter. Um, it must be an old matter. Well, he said when Alberto Argus and, and Alberto was a police over 30 years oh, ago. No, that, so that's, that's, that's the... So yeah. if, if kidnapping has a statute yeah, of that's, limitation? That's, yeah, that's, uh, that's gone. I see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can only take one more call because we only have a couple more minutes before the commissioner gives his final statement. Our number is 280-4299. 280-4299. Dominique? I, I have no further questions for now, at least. It's not like a liar, Dominique. Well, uh, don't be surprised he doesn't uh, <laughs> meet you in the court one of these days. Uh, all right, we have we have a uh, final caller, and we really appreciate this call. Welcome, caller. Good morning, um, everybody. Good morning, Commissioner. This morning. is Sandra Coy. Just a quick comment. Um, you see the clause, um, the section in the law, in section chapter two, Dominique, that you quoted on the that's called the right to life clause. That's clause. Yes. And it's a, I'm glad you brought it up. Very impressed because it, that has that 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 section of the law has bothered me for forever. And when our present prime minister was in the opposition and was on the radio at one time, I called him and asked him what was he going to do about that section of the law of our constitution because in in the constitution of many countries. The right to life is not conditional. Our constitution gives you a conditional right to life. But other constitutions give you an absolute right to life. So there is no clause, no caveat that allows the state or to take your life. And it is under that section, for example, that Mr. Gutierrez in Orange War would have been shot. Or if you ask about somebody, um, uh, somebody, and be choked to death because he was resisting um, arrest, and and um, just other force was a very thing. But the Costa Rican Constitution, for example, Commissioner, you, it is, you might be interested in reading it. It's in Spanish, but maybe you could get a translation. For example, the Costa Rican Constitution, there is no conditional right to life. The right to life is absolute, and and our our conditional right to life comes out of the slave laws. You see, under the slave laws, and um, the slave did not have an absolute right to life, and in some instances, no right to life. So I just wanted to make that comment. Bye bye. Right, thank you. Yeah, what, I, what I agree um, to some extent, um, even though those constitutional may not have conditional, it is absolute, it will still be subject to, to the land. Even look at international conventions, they also speak to what you refer to as justifiable killing. Because the, the, the law must be structured in such a way that, yes, we all have a, a right to life, but if it is that we engage in an act that requires someone to, to defend themselves against us, and that person takes our life, then that person will be justified. So at the end of the day, it still goes back to the whole issue of justification and ensuring that whatever force is used, that it is proportionate. And I think one of the reasons why most of those countries refer to an absolute right to life is because of the issue of the death penalty, right? And I personally, I do not believe in the death penalty either. I, I, don't, I think that if a state mm. is to execute somebody, then the state is no better than a person that they're executing. Mm. 
That is my, my take on the death penalty. Interesting. Right? So, but I do believe that persons should be able to defend themselves from any threat that is likely to take their life. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a final comment, yeah. uh, Commissioner, That's you right. are a trained attorney, and one simply assumes that you will not be wearing the cap of Commissioner forever and ever, even though you're getting high accolades as to the work that you're doing now. But what would you want your legacy to be during the time that you served as Commissioner of Police? Well, right now, but I'm really, I am working on a policy manual for police. And uh, that policy manual will determine how police officers are to respond to different situations. I'm also looking at revising the police standing orders, which has been outdated. That was put in place by former Commissioner Sherman Zuniga in 1990. Oh, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so it has been outdated. Um, those two things, and uh, to ensure that the welfare of police officers is taken care of. I, I know that people might say, oh, you have a police association who's a local for the welfare of the officers, but the chief welfare officer of the police department is the commissioner of police. And so I want to ensure that I put things in place, like what I'm working on now. We recently got a bus for the officers who work in the West and who work in the city and live in the West. So that bus brings the officers who come on at 11 at night and take those out who comes up at 11. So there's no need for officers to be hitchhiking at night time to come to work or to go home. I am now working on getting a bus for the North. You know we have the issue with um, the bus company, BTS, and the Ministry of Transport and uh, the other bus companies. And officers are really complaining. And so what I want to do, we have the police trust fund and we have the police reward fund. Those two accounts are very hefty in funds. Our officers are in dire need of our transportation for the night. So I've discussed with the CEO that what we will do, we'll take half of the money from the police trust fund and half from the police reward fund and we're going to purchase a bus for the night. Mm -hmm. So the officers from the night mm -hmm. can also have that transportation for them to come to work at night and to go home at night time. The next thing I want to work on, we have a um, big space at Queen Street Police Station where the canteen used to be. We have many police officers who are becoming overweight, obese, they cannot work out. So I want to convert that area into a gym. It, it is not going to cost us too much. We do have the funds in the police trust fund and the police reward fund, and our officers, these are welfare issues. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't see no difficulty why the money cannot be, cannot be used to put things in place that is going to enhance the welfare of our officers, mm -hmm. that is going to keep our officers fit. You know, on a, on a daily basis, they can go to the gym and work out and stay in shape. Mm -hmm. So those are things that I'm working on currently. But again, but I'm really, when I leave the department, I want to, to, to have a, a legacy that people can look back on and say, you know what, we achieved this under Commissioner Williams. Mm -hmm. And those are the things I'm trying to work on with a view to make it better for my officers. Well, unless Dominique has any uh, point uh, she'd like to make, uh, Dominique? Uh, no, this man has to leave. And he's wandering so much time already. I tell and you, and I, big people like, yeah, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I tell you, yeah. Well, we appreciate very much your being here, <laughs> sir. And uh, we keep this forum open for you. Uh, we think you need to be able to talk to the people and the people need to be able to talk to you. And you can always rely on CREM and CREM TV and radio uh, to give you that access to the people of Belize. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Madam Nuri. I'm always grateful to be here and uh, to those who listen and those who call in and say thanks. And let us continue the spirit. Let's continue to work together to make things safer. Indeed. All right, we'll take a break, and uh, I had this delay because it's not being caused by us here at Creme Television. It's coming from the cable company. The other cable company, people are not having this delay. But if you're seeing the delay with your cable company, please call them and tell them you're tired of seeing 
this delay it takes away from the very quality of the show. Our number here is uh, 280-4299. And please make your comment very, very brief. And please don't rehash things that we've already dealt with. Thank you very much. Welcome, caller. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, good morning. Bidis and host of the WB. Mr. Nuri. Yeah, this is the, the second time you recall, Mr. Usher. I, know, I hope that you're not going to be trying to. I want to raise a concern, I really want to raise a concern. Uh, yeah, but I just but don't want to rehash what you've already dealt with no, with I'm the land issue. No, this is no, no rehash. All right, so. My concern is this, right? Okay. That after I call, then you, you made like a commentary on what I said. Yeah, well, I have but the right I to do that, sir. I have the right yes, to make a commentary yeah, on what right. you're saying. I'm not disputing that, but what I want to say, I just want to make reference to that, like, for example, in relation to the comment I said. You said that, like, basically I should tell, go and tell Johnny Britain or something. You're rehashing it, yeah. sir, and I don't want to go over but, that again. No, but you have made your comment, and I've made my comment. Why are we no, going to take no, just no, the last no, few no, moments no, of the no, show no, to no, do no, that? I right? Yeah, well, I think it was unfair. Because you don't know, you are not aware of the discussion that I have with Mr. Johnny Brichet when, when I'm on meeting. All right, so well then, sir, what, what you should do you is make sure that you... That. Um, JC, I don't want to go through this with Miss Man. I told him we're not going to rehash, and he's finding another way to rehash. The number here is 280-4299. Um, we, we were expecting another uh, guest who would be coming in by phone but uh, I'm not sure if he's on now. All right. He's going to call? All right. So, JC, you should expect the call downstairs, and we'll go from that. Dominique? Um, well, I just want to give you my final comments because I'm going to order if Brassinger comes on. Yeah. Um, that's going to take up the last couple of minutes. But um, I, I personally, and for Belize to hear, want to congratulate Yaya. And wow. her team on the protest that they hosted yesterday both virtually and um yaya being yaya ended yeah. up in front of the u.s embassy we see the, the photo there did her own thing yes um i think it's it's a huge representation of the, the fire that still lives within the religion society i think um for for me see it <laughs> I think it's it's I, it, this, are, this is what I love to see. We love to see it is what we say mm. nowadays. We love to see it. We love to see the, the fire and we love to see the representation and we love to see the woman and we love to see the black woman. So I have to give Yaya and her team, um, Yasser Musa, Katie Usher, Michaela Marin, all the big up even more for organizing um, this this international this act of international solidarity. Yeah. Because people people stay misconstrue what what this whole movement is about um it's it's but why the fear why the fear again i call yeah, your attention I, I call your attention to the amandala editorial uh -huh. uh, for those who didn't hear me earlier uh pick up the amandala i know you normally do but read this editorial because yeah. it tries to make the connection of why we should be concerned about what's going on uh, uh or what's coming out of this police abuse issue mm -hmm. in the United States and giving a historical background mm -hmm. about it. And a lot of people seem to, just based on what I read on the Facebook post, a lot of people are disconnected and feel like, chow, that a fide problem, we know, yeah. you know, that a why, yeah. why, you know, always one person say, uno de fala foot. Yeah, I mean, so, so is that saying that all over the world, people who are speaking out are fala footing? Yeah. The Americans, we don't understand yeah, that. Racism, racism is a systematic thing, and it's a, it's a thing that doesn't respect borders. Yeah. So, and it's a historical thing. So, for the mere fact that we used to be a British colony, that to tell you that yeah. racism has been here, oh, yeah. is here, yes. is entrenched within our laws, and yeah. this call we rightfully um, mentioned when I referenced the the piece of law for the commissioner, it's it's here and it exists. Yes. Um, and I I have to partly blame that on just just education, not just formal education, but informal education yes. and, and just consciousness raising and consciousness building because we fail to realize like I was I was looking back at um, some Facebook posts because Facebook has this thing where you have your memories 
-hmm. And at last year, well, in 2018, um, some playwrights in Guatemala brought back this play from 49 years ago and they edited it in 1992 and then they put it on stage in, 19, um, in 2018 and it had Belizeans displayed with blackface. Mm -hmm. And so you know that racism still exists with blackface and these exaggerated eyes yes, and exaggerated yes. nose. And, and it was the former president that was doing that. Yeah. He was a comedian. And, and uh, so it, it's, it's, it's there, so it's know, there. You know that racism exists and Belize is, uh, Belize is just always our people sometimes. Yeah. We live in this bubble of everything so all right here and or we want to just stick our issues to us but we fail to realize how small the world is simply because of globalization. Yeah. Um, and we, with the struggles of black people in the United States are our struggle because the state is so deeply um, intermingled with our politics and our, yeah. our geopolitics. So we can't escape that. Um, and what I have said publicly, just one last point, um, is that I am a little bit disappointed that the bodies that represent black people in Belize or whose entities are prim primarily black has, have said nothing. Mm -hmm. I have heard nothing from the Creole Council. I have heard nothing from the NDC of which I'm a part. So I, have to take part blame for that too. Yeah. Um, and it's not that I haven't mentioned it. It's mm. just I guess it does not get to the to the to the right ears yet. Um, because Garifuna people are in the states. Garifuna people who are black too. Yeah. Um, who who face the same thing as African Americans. I think it's important that we all know that racism does exist. It, the microaggressions that you face when you get followed at the shop and I, or somebody else. Or yeah. when you send money to somebody and then somebody else will look different for you can't say it and then they answer that person. These things exist and we can't live in this uh, this state of oblivion to say that, oh, well, this does not believe issue. Indeed, indeed. Um, because it does exist. Well, uh, you've said so many things. <laughs> uh, first of all, yes, Yaya stands out as a person who has personal conviction for what she believes in and this is very important. Secondly, um, not only should we have seen the NGC, the so-called black groups in Belize speaking out about it, but the issue was an issue of injustice. Mm -hmm. I can say of the Muslim community who has a, a root and an origin in black consciousness, not that Islam has anything necessarily to do with race, but our Muslim community in Belize, which is over 60 years old, has a root in standing up for black people. And there has been no public statements coming from the community. But if you see our chat group among ourselves, there's a strong consciousness that we're there. We were um, posting back and forth, and you can see that within the community, there is a strong repulsion to what was going on there and a need for us to stand up and even a call for demonstrating against injustice not only in the United States but wherever it exists. So kudos to my Muslim brothers and sisters. But they didn't make any public statement yeah. in this regard and it's very important that a public statement be made. Thirdly, um, and, and, and please understand the context in which I am saying this. Those people who were protesting in the United States were breaking the law because there was a curfew law that they defied in order to get their point across. And even the police department in New York and several other jurisdictions came to the point where they said, listen, this matter is so important, let us not conflict with these people regarding this curfew, let them blow off that steam as necessary. Now you got some law and other people, of which our commissioner is. Obviously. Have the thinking that, listen, if you break the law, okay, how much the principal, principle is a good principle, you broke the law. He said that clearly with uh, Nigel Petillo, that he is, uh, doesn't have a problem with the issue of squatting, doesn't have a problem of going after your own land, but just wait until the SOE is over. Some people say, no, 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 this thing is so important, I want to broke the law in order to get my point. Well, he has to respond as a lawman. But in the bigger picture, we have to understand that sometimes laws are made to contain. Laws certainly are made to keep social order, but sometimes if a law 
stops you, especially from a principle that is bigger than the law, because laws are made not to be broken, but they are made to be changed. They are made to be amended when new information comes, for example, with the slavery laws. Yes, we, if you, if you didn't do certain things and they told you, the law said that you can't go into this restaurant because you're black, you can't eat from this area because you're black, that is the law. So should I continue to follow that law or do I break that law in order that the lawmakers will understand is that law a just law? So we don't get into a long issue about that. We're getting close to the end. So let's go to the final phone call. Welcome caller. Carla is gone. All right, we'll take our final break and we'll come back and close off. Do you know anything about Gilnet? Have you ever heard of a Gilnet? Do you know what a gillnet is? I grew up there, yeah, bro, seaside. And like, we use this like so much years. But it's dangerous. It, it's, not, it's not the best way to fish. They hurt the animals. I don't really agree with the gillnet. I prefer the hand fishing. Animals like manatees, dolphins, turtles, some of these animals are facing extinction. They are in the net. The oil in it take up all kind of things. They scrape the sea. No creo que deben de tener esto en el océano porque mata todos los animalitos. A cualquiera que atrape ahí, ahí lo matan. It is very destructive to the reef and to the organisms that get trapped within the gill net. So. Fish or a manatee or anything would feel being trapped in something like this. I don't want them to trap any more manatees or turtles. It's entrapping the smaller fish and then that will be less fishes for a future generation. So many other ways that you can fish. Deben decir otro método para pescar. I say better than better. We don't have to worry. We have things for the future and generation, generation going on, no? I want to support for money. Maybe we save the man to life. Man is important than I believe, so I'm going to save it. Belizeans say no to gillnets. If we all fish sustainably, we can always fish. It's a hammer, it's a drill, it's super handy dads. That's right folks, it's Super Handy Dads Month again at Brothers Event. And do we have some super gifts for that super special dad. A Super Handy Dad needs his super tools. And all month long, we're giving you super savings of 15% off all power tools and accessories from Stanley, Black & Decker, Dewalt, Skill, Bosch, and Walkie. 15% off all Stanley hand tools and 15% off sun tool, hand tools, and hardware. So come in today to Brothers Habet and Barrack Road for Super Handed Dad's Month and pick up those super tools at Super Savings. It's a hammer, it's a drill, it's super handed. Yeah, where do you want? Tickle up, my dog. Yeah, at the car, at the car. Everybody has that one loyal friend. <laughs> Brits, you could pick up the girl for me? I can't, I'll check out. I could borrow your tennis. Mm. That's one pretty key. I could borrow my medication. <sighs> Loyalty doesn't have to be this hard. With Smart's new Stars and Rewards Loyalty Program, prepaid customers get star points easily. Every time you make a call, purchase a bundle or upload credit, you get rewarded. With these points, you can stack them up and get awesome rewards like free data, free SMS minutes, and extra on uploads plus lots more. So the more you use, the more you get. And if you want to check your reward stars, just download the Smart app, enter the My Account portal, or send a free SMS to Zone. That's 9663. And in the body, write rewards. Then you can enjoy the loyal life. Smart, your full-service telecom provider. We call it Earth. And yet nine-tenths of the space for life lies in the ocean. This great expanse provides half the oxygen we breathe, it regulates the planet's climate, and feeds billions of people. Without a healthy ocean, there would be no life as we know it. 
However, human activities and climate change have put it under pressure. The ocean has taken care of us for generations, but we need to take much better care of it into the future. From mangroves to coral reefs, from the polar regions to the open ocean, we must create marine protected areas. These special places safeguard biodiversity and sustain ecosystems. They help absorb carbon and provide livelihoods for millions of coastal communities. But above all, they give us hope for the future. In 2010, world leaders agreed to protect one-tenth of the ocean. We now know that this is not enough. To give the ocean and humanity a chance, we must look after the whole ocean. And we need to reach at least 30% protection within the next decade. Now is the time for action to come together and to scale up effective protection for the future of us all. When you bank your way, it's amazing how much time you have to enjoy the more important things in life. You have time for priceless moments, time to indulge, time to unwind, time to take in the view, time to make memories. Use any of these services and have time for the things that matter most. Bank your way and enjoy the convenience. Atlantic Bank, building the future together. Show them really care, them give it ten thousand dollar every And this is just enough time to uh, say, goodbye. say goodbye, no? All right. See you later. I say, give us the salams, uh, which means peace be unto you. 
So any last word on your... I just, everyone have a safe weekend. Um, we get uh, extended curfew, um, but please, please just remain safe. Keep a social distancing, wear a mask. Yeah, I've, I've, well, abbreviated curfew, I guess. Mr. Correction is, yes, in, your, is I, in our ears. Yes, I always He's an engineer, so he can, one-on-one, on one, I always too with JC. <laughs> All right, so we thank you very much, uh, uh, Dominique, for being here. Uh, of course, God willing, we'll see Mose Hyde and David uh, Almandaris as well as Dominique on Monday. Uh, my, my thing here is a Thursday, Friday thing, and we appreciate very much uh, those who called in to speak to the commissioner. Um, even Mr. Osha, you know, you leave political thing there, we understand. Uh, and we appreciate you anyway. We ask also for Sandra Coey and the others who called uh, to the commissioner. And we appreciate also Mr. Torres that called us in the first part of the show. Belizean, stand strong. Well, make a tank. JC Arzu downstairs in simulcast. Uh, the man who was here long before. So, you know, we need to do a lee history on JC, you know, because, you know, he's one of the unsung heroes around here in Cremandola. Also, Mr. Cliff Lewis, also a person that goes way, 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 way back. Uh, we are newcomers to this stage, but the guys are been a long, long time, you know, long time. So we appreciate them. We also had uh, Harlan Wagner on the controls as well as trainee, apprenticeship, all kind of thing you call Jada Anderson. But Jay is taking care of business and we respect her. She's a youth. And uh, so, the Legion stand strong, stand firm. And for now, we gone! Wake up, Billy's, wake up, Billy's. Another day, another day is here. Wake up, Billy's, wake up, Billy's. We gotta keep moving, na 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 na. Wake up, Billy's, wake up, Billy's. Everybody gotta put their time in. Wake up, Billy's, wake up, Billy's. Voice our opinion and place your calling. Double your be yourself, see yourself. This is a show my people. Billy's our hope, so to need less reason. Nobody feel left out, it's the vibe we deal in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, respect, and selfishness and cooperation.